All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the last day of CSE 525. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, sorry about that delay. I was just on the roof uh, making some changes to my PV array, uh, and I completely lost track of time. So I apologize. I was just trying to <laughs> make myself presentable. Um, but uh, here we are. So uh, I have decided how we're going to... Um, how we're going to do this last day of class. We're going to pick up with the KiCad uh, example that I had, and then I'm going to show you how to get it ready in CAM, uh, in flat CAM, and we're not going to have time. There's no way we're going to have time to actually mill it out on the CNC. So what I'm going to do is, uh, this is actually a part I want, and in order to do that, uh, I need to make it. Uh, in order to use it, I need to make it, and so in order to make it, I have to actually run it through the CNC. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a narrated video um, at some point, and uh, I will show you uh, how it's working uh, so you can hopefully see everything operational. Does that sound like a plan? Is that something we can work with today? Um, because I just don't see how we're going to get uh, how we're going to get everything done on time uh, with the CNC. If that sounds cool, I'll show you uh, how we're going to get this board ready on KeyCAD. I'll show you how you can uh, export it directly to something that JLCPCB can do if you want to have the boards ordered, if you don't want to mess with a, um, uh, a, uh, <clears throat> a CNC. But I'll, I'll record the video, and you guys will have that in uh, here, hopefully by the end of the week once I make that part. If that sounds good, that's what we'll proceed with. Uh, I need just one minute, and I'll be right back, folks. All right, let's resume here, folks. Um, now, uh, where did we leave off? Well, we were working in KiCad, and uh, so that's where we're going to pick up. Hopefully, uh, yeah, we were working on EE. Uh, no, the uh, PCB new, which is the um, the PC board setup. Uh, so, can somebody tell me when the screen share goes live? Uh, I'm waiting to, there. I think it's live, yep. right? Okay, yep, you great. got it. And class is being recorded. Great. All right. So we started with our EE schema. This is the board that we came up with. We had the uh, Helltech LoRa 32 board. That's going to be my um, uh, long distance radio device. We had some push buttons. These are pulled down. Uh, well, th they have pull up resistors connected to it. Sorry. Uh, and and the switch pulls it. Um, pulls it down to ground, uh, and that's what the ESP32 is going to be looking for, okay? So we set up the labels, we ran our rule checker, uh, it said everything was cool, we uh, assigned our footprints. <clears throat> oh boy, this is going to make it make it slow. I'm just going to turn off Windows Defender here because that always gets in the way. All right, we did our footprint assignments. I know you can't see that very well. Um, <clears throat> and let's go ahead and turn off my notifications. And then we went to the board layout. Now, the board layout is going to be different than how you saw it last time. And I've gone ahead and optimized it a little bit. So I've made the whole board smaller. I've rearranged the resistors and the push buttons. Uh, so they're all in nice, neat locations. And let me see if I can uh, zoom in just a little bit. Uh, what you'll see is there's a filled zone around the outside. And then there are some edge cuts that correspond there as well. These are what the CNC is going to use to cut the board out. <clears throat> and remember, this is front only uh, PCB. Um, uh, and uh, everything is on the back. We use the F key to flip the components on the back, right? This is flip forward. This is flip back, forward, back. So it's on the back side right now, which is where we want it to be. 
And we routed everything using a one-sided board, which can be tricky. You can see I've had to move stuff around uh, so that none of the traces cut each other off. Now this on its own is not going to work well with the CNC. Uh, these will work just fine uh, at JLC PCB or any fab because these are you know, standard industry standard traces. But the CNC, I'm gonna use a half millimeter bit to cut this. And these traces are just too small. The pads are too small. They're gonna end up all getting cut out. Uh, that's not good. And so right now, let me show you, um, by the way, if you're on this board, if you do control B, it removes the filled zones. So anything that has ground contact that you see where it says GND, and these guys and this guy are not getting contact to ground right now. Uh, and of course, that's not good. So if I hit B, it's going to fill the zones. Now, you see there's a ground pin here, but it's actually cut off from the rest of the world by this wire, except for the fact that, um, <clears throat> let's see, where do I have uh, my ground net? Where is that going? Uh, there is another ground here somewhere else that I think both might be connected. Um, we just have to watch out that we're not cutting off ground to anything, and that can happen pretty easily, okay? Uh, right now, this pin is getting ground from the board. This pin is getting ground from, uh, I'm not entirely sure. It's probably getting ground because of one of these resistance resistors has a ground pin, and that way the ground plane makes it out all the way over here. Now, if we do Alt-3, this is our 3D viewer. You can see, um, Anything that has these like cross hatchy components there on a pad, that's a ground connect. And you can see that it has, okay, it has a route to ground through here. It has a route to ground uh, uh, around. And yeah, that's the only route it has. So be careful with these one-sided boards that you don't remove your path to ground. And in fact, because we're going to be changing the tolerances here, I'm going to edit this wire here. Uh, I'm going to delete these components here. Um, I don't want to delete the whole the whole track, so I'm just going to do this piecewise uh, because I want this to um, uh, to respect my clearances pretty nicely. All right, so that should have <clears throat> a better path, and I'm going to unfill and refill just once more, and then Alt three, and you can see now there's more clearance up here. I want as much clearance as possible because I don't want these guys to be smushed. I did use the auto push pull router. Uh, it likes to be super aggressive in how it routes some of these things. I toned it back. Uh, in other words, I manually clicked off some of these points that you see here. Actually, you don't want some of these 90 degree marks. These can cause weird effects. Uh, but for now, this will be okay, uh, especially since not all of these pins are connected. Now, uh, if we go ahead and look on the other side, there is our, our usable PCB. It doesn't have any of the hardware footprints for the switches. It just shows their outline, but these are standard. Uh, little through hole switches. Um, let's see if I can find them. I might collect your jewelry here for some reason. Um, that's what happens when kids pull on everything. Okay, uh, I don't know where one of those switches is right now. I think I actually mounted it to something. But anyway, these are uh, through hole uh, momentary push button switches. And this board looks relatively good. Uh, could we make it smaller? Absolutely. I just wanted to give you guys an understanding of how these all get routed. <clears throat> so that it looks uh, about the right way, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and save this, but now comes our problem. And our problem is that these tracks and vias are too small. So I'm going to save uh, save copy as I'm going to do this for JLC. JLC. Now, uh, what you can do uh, when you're doing these is we're doing just signaling, okay? We're not doing any power wires. If we were doing power connectors over here in EE schema, we would want to maybe designate some of these as, um, <clears throat> as power wires instead of, so here you can connect different type of bus wires, standard wires. You can denote them as uh, having power sources, power sinks, and so on and so forth. Um, and the important part is you can create different nets for different wire types so that you have, you know, your power lines are a bit thicker, your uh, <clears throat> your ground lines are, or your uh, signal lines are a little bit thinner. Uh, and those are important uh, when you're generating your net list. Um, so um, 
for now, uh, we don't need that. We're just going to stick uh, with 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 this, and we're going to do a single size. So we're going to go to our board setting up board settings in the top left, uh, and I'm going to go to my net classes. Uh, this says net classes. Uh, let me screen snip this uh, so you can see it. Do 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 do, and embiggen it. No notifications. <clears throat> Swipe you over here. All right, hopefully everybody can see that. These are the settings that I'm going to change. The clearances, I'm going to make these one millimeter. The track width, I'm going to make one millimeter. I'm, I don't have any vias, so I'm not worried about those. The uh, drill size, 0.8 mil is fine. I have everything in millimeters right now. I prefer to work in metric over inches just because so many of the other programs run in metric. It just makes it a lot easier. Uh, I really hate converting in, 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 in imperial system, but whatever. Um, Okay, all this looks good. Uh, I'm going to leave the VIA size the same because these are 0.8 millimeter holes, which my 0.8 millimeter drill bit is going to go through. Okay, uh, so that all looks good. Cool. So I'm going to, sorry, I have to update these. So I'm going to make the clearances one millimeter and the track widths one millimeter. Uh, because again, the CNC, at least the cheap one that I have, is not able to. Um, it's it's not able to really uh, give me some of the, the the tolerances that I need. So we're going to go ahead and hit OK. And so all of our net classes have changed. Uh, let me just take one more look here at tracks and vias. Um, so these, unfortunately, have not been updated. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, Let's see, can we update these? I'm going to hit I to get the entire track. And then I'm going to go to properties and set these to one millimeter. These will fatten up. Uh, <clears throat> again, do the entire network. You can hit E for properties. Make this one millimeter. I know these are going to look hideous, but that's OK. Uh, and change this to, uh, I'm going to tell it to actually use net class widths. Uh, that should be better. Now you can instantly see I have a problem with this one, so I'm going to have to reroute that one. I, by the way, selects the entire path, and I'm going to tell it use net class widths. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to do this one and go to properties, tell it to use the net class width. So now all of these guys are using the net class widths. Uh, I do have a clearance problem here, uh, so I'm going to, um, I'm not going to delete the whole trace. I'm going to delete these two segments here, uh, and then I'm going to add my new line in here. Uh, that gives us a little bit more clearance. There we go. <clears throat> All right. And I'm going to unfill and refill so the back plane is, or the, the ground plane is filled. Now let's look at this. Whoa, look how big those traces are. <laughs> Again, we're making sure that ground is alive. It's good. We have access to ground through everything. Where is ground coming from? It's coming from USB. So that means that this little sucker right here, this one pin, one ping only, right? Uh, this one pin only, um, uh, yes, it does great with acute angles. Um, <clears throat> it has no problem with angles. It's the, the problem is the, the clearances with a half millimeter drill bit. All right, so here is our ground plane, and that is feeding to everything as far as I can tell. Uh, do we have anything chopped off? Um, I am seeing a ground here that I'm worried about because I don't see any connectivity. Uh, so we'll have to double check this. It's grounded here. This is this this island. There's no ground. Um, so we'll have to take a look. It's possible. Yeah. See how it says ground, and it, I don't I don't think it has. Yeah. All right. Here we have a problem. This uh, ground and this ground have no connectivity. Uh, so what we're going to have to do is uh, edit this a little bit, and I'm going to wire around. Actually, I'm going to keep editing this. Um, and first, we're going to do a ground wire. Uh, I'm going to try to 
pull this around as close as possible. Okay, there's one, and then we're going to try to connect the rest of this. Ah, it doesn't want to let me do it because my board is ever so slightly too big. Uh, all right, now it's letting me do it. Great. Sometimes the push-pull router gets picky. All right, now we should have that problem resolved. This is not necessarily the best way to do this, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, because you may run into some isolation issues. Um, you may run into issues where you have a, a signal line too close to ground. These are just push buttons, so I really don't care. Um, I don't like how acute that angle is, so I'm going to uh, edit this. Uh, and with the track, maybe this one I'm going to delete. Yeah, I'll delete that one too. <clears throat> and there's a hotkey for getting to wire, and I don't remember what the heck it is. Um, all right, there we go. That should, now I'm going to unfill and refill and everything seems connected. These are the things you have to be careful about with single layer PCBs. So we have path to ground around here. So even though it gets cut off here, it's not a huge deal. Our right, thing has ground that should have ground. Uh, we don't have a positive plane, uh, so we should be good to go. Now, uh, let's go ahead and get this ready for manufacturer. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to file and then plot. And then there, I'm going to make sure I have the front copper, the back copper. There is no back copper. Okay. Uh, front paste, back paste. Uh, this is for solder paste, uh, locations, uh, the silk screening for the text, uh, the, uh, the solder masks and edge cuts and everything else. I'm going to give it an output directory. I'm going to call it plots. And hopefully I'm making these videos in a way that you can sing along as well. Uh, and then we just hit plot, bam, done. This creates a Gerber format um, that I'm going to be using for both the CNC and JLC PCB. Then we generate the drill files. We're gonna use Exelon. Uh, it's gonna go into the plots folder. Sorry if you can't see this, but you can pretty much live, leave this exactly the way it is. You can change things to PDF, but of course JLC PCB and my CNC don't know what to do with that. So we're gonna generate the drill files. These are for the holes, bam and we're done. By the way, speaking of, let's look at these pads. We're not done here, I just realized. We need to make these pads bigger. Uh, and uh, that's important because we're not able uh, to CNC these pads the way they are. And I can't believe I almost forgot this. So we're gonna look at these. I'm gonna make the, um, the, the Y size, I kinda like, I'm gonna just uh, 1.8. I'm going to make these just a little bit fatter. Well, that's not fat enough. Um, let's try 2.2, oops, uh, and 1.8. <clears throat> okay, I think this should help. That makes the pads a little bit fatter for the CNC to route around. And I'm going to go to pads here and push the pad properties to all of these. Bam, they are all updated, just like that. Uh, I'm going to do the same for these guys. Uh, I'm going to edit the pad properties and I'm going to make these, since these are round, I'm just going to make them 2.2 all the way around. Uh, I should be able to push pad properties again to anything that has something like this. Uh, let's try it. No, it didn't do it. So push pad properties. Um, it doesn't want to change pads on identical footprints maybe. Okay, it's done a few of these and now we need to do the other one. <coughs> Edit and we're gonna do size 2.2, right? And the whole size is 0.8 millimeters, which is I want it, what, it, what I want it to be. And I'm gonna push pad to identical footprints. Bam, that's got the other resistors done. Uh, now I gotta do these guys. Uh, let's edit these pads and I want these to be 2.2 just so that I have enough to solder with. Whole size we're going to leave at 0.8 actually. That way the drill just has to go through rather than make a circle. That's really helpful. Okay, now I'm going to push pads, pad properties, change pads on identical footprints, and there they all are. Okay, nice fat pads. That's what I want. Uh, if they're not fat, I would recommend for a CNC 2.2 mil. Uh, because if you don't, uh, with at least, now you can use a, a carving bit, like a V bit. I've had nothing but trouble with V bits. Maybe it's just my CNC, maybe it's the V bits, but the V bits don't really get all the copper out. 
and especially if you do a very shallow cut. And what you end up with is all this junk um, that you have to scrape out by hand and use a screwdriver. It's crap. So I recommend using a standard, um, you know, flat nosed end mill, a half a millimeter cutting bit, not a V bit. Uh, it will cut deeper. It will isolate better. The downside is you have to use these gigantic um, vias and tracks and clearances. Okay. And we can see that there's overlapping clearance issues right now. Okay. Let's look at our PCB now. Uh, let me just unfill and refill and let's look at the PCB. Yep. Everything got nice and fat. So far, we don't see any issues with something that doesn't have ground. Even this has ground. Everything has ground. That's fantastic. So actually, one of these uh, extra tracks that were out here, um, we don't even need this one. Uh, this one is not necessary at all because for whatever reason, this is now accessible. Uh, so I'm actually going to delete it, fill and refill, and let's see. Yep, we actually have ground connectivity all the way around to these pads, so we're good there. Uh, all right, all this is uh, unfilled. This is all ground plane, and our PCB still looks the same way it used to. Okay, any questions so far about the PCB uh, setup and the design? Any questions? Uh, if you've got them, ask them. Okay, and we have, look at all these giant clearances in between. This is bad for, uh, for normal PCB designs, but great for CNCs. Uh, all right, let me make sure I don't have any. I'm going to get rid of this weird angle here, and I'm going to retrace this. Uh, there we go. Come on. You know what I mean. Okay. Unfill, refill. That's a very important thing. By the way, there is an auto router you can try. I have found it is often more trouble than it's worth. In some cases, I have done entire boards with the auto router. There is a component called free routing. Um, it looks a little bit like this. Um, and what you do is you, uh, you create what's called a Spectra DSN session here in KiCad. You export it. That's the file that tells it, hey, here, uh, here are my, all my traces. You feed it into the auto router. You open the design. Let's just see if it, does it have anything recent? Um, I don't think it does, but um, yeah, it, there's nothing that I can really show you here. Then you click go. Half the time, it'll just sit there and spin and never reach uh, uh, consensus. It'll never converge, but sometimes it will if you have a particularly good design. Honestly, just route it yourself. You won't. What what will end up happening is the auto router will do the best job it can and then leave you with one trace that it can't possibly route and it'll flip back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, and then you'll actually spend more time correcting it than I spent routing this, if that makes any sense. All right, now let's generate our plots again because all this has changed. You can see that this is pretty iterative. I'm gonna hit the plot button and then I'm gonna go to the drill files and generate the drill files. Done and done. All right, so what does this look like if I go to JLC PCB? Let's go. Uh, let's, uh, I'll sign in here, give me a sec. Uh, so we can make this. Uh, yeah, go ahead. And I'll show you how easy it is to do this. So while I get signed in, and by the way, the question may occur, uh, am I, is all this information uh, getting uh, stolen uh, by a Chinese company somewhere? And, I, and I'm being very sincere, possibly. I don't know. I don't know what the privacy policies really are. That's why I don't publish. And, you know, that's why I don't have anything fabricated. That's, you know, super crazy. Uh, anyway, uh, you can see that uh, there is a number of board designs, four, two layer, four and six layer. Two layer usually works just fine. A lot of people just say go with four layer because then you have a lot fewer routing issues. I think that two layer is fine. Uh, so, all right, here are all of my uh, drill and uh, my uh, Gerber and drill files, uh, Gerber and Exelon files. I'm going to create a zip file out of it. Uh, I'm going to put it in plots.zip. Bam, there it is. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to quote a board. We're going to get quote now. And here is where we add the Gerber files. Uh, oops, that's not what I want. Oh, crap. Let me do this again. OK, add Gerber file. Um, let's see. Uh, let's go back here and go to my plots. And here we go. 
Now it's going to process all of these files and it should show us everything that we need. Now, if we're using an SMT, uh, like a surface mount parts, you'll want to create a stencil, but we're not doing surface mount. These are through holes. Hey, look, there's my board. That's exactly how it's supposed to look. There's a silk screening, everything. If I like this, I tend to actually do the lead free hazel, uh, the surface treatment costs just a dollar more. And then you hit uh, save to cart. Let's see, is everything the way I want it to? Yeah, 57 by 81. Yes, this is a grand total of $2 plus a dollar for the extra lead free treatment. Save to cart. And that's it, guys. $2 for five boards. And if you go to checkout, it does, yes, it does cost you $17 to have it shipped, but that's DHL shipping. It's usually at your home in about three days. Okay, so uh, there's everything you need to know. Okay, so that's how you quote it with JLC PCB. That's literally all you need to get it started, and then you can have it fabricated. Now, I'm not going to have it fabricated. Uh, I, I, I really don't need it to do that. I guess I could. Um, and you can look at the top and bottom layers. And uh, yeah, that's all you need. So that's pretty cool, right? We can do this. Uh, we can have it ordered just like that. If you don't have a CNC, don't want to bother with a CNC. And trust me, it takes a while. There's a learning curve. Uh, just have them made, and they'll be at your home in about a week. Uh, that's all there is to it. Only thing is you want to make sure that all these uh, things are quoted well or that, that they're set up well so you won't have any problems. And that's it. We could have done two layer board with JLC PCB, but I've done these as one layer because I want to show you how it works with the uh, CNC. And here's our lead free finish. You can see it'll be silver. That's exactly how the board's going to look, guys. Is that cool? All right. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll close this uh, because we don't need that for now. And um, let's get back to PCB new. Uh, all right. So here are our plots. Uh, all right, here's our design. We've got our plots. The plots are all here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect to my computer in the basement that has uh, that's connected to the CNC. And I'm going to show you how we work with the uh, flat cam software that allows us to basically generate what's called isolation routing. And from that, uh, I'll show you how to import it into the CNC's control software. And that's where we'll stop because we're not actually going to have time to start the CNC. Like I said, I'll show you that on a, on a video, uh, hopefully by the end of this week. So I'm going to connect remotely to my basement computer. Uh, and um, I think I have a spam call coming in. Yeah, most likely. All right. Um, and I'm going to open uh, an application called FlatCam. This is, now this is on a remote desktop, so please forgive me. This will be a little bit on the slow side. Okay. Uh, can you guys all see this? I mean, I know that the, the, the backgrounds are probably identical, but I, I can see it on my screen on my screen share. So I, I hope everybody's good. All right, this is FlatCam. It's beta software. It's open source. It's really cool. It does have some bugs. Um, and I just realized I screwed up something in the design, but that's okay. It's not going to cause us a big problem. Um, but uh, I need to get the path for uh, where the hell I saved my PCB. <laughs> um, let me see. I opened it here for a reason. There it is. It's an attempt folder. Okay, cool. So I'm going to go ahead and open uh, some Gerber files. These are the ones that we created. I'm going to uh, put this on the right folder. Uh, that's no longer relational like that. All right. Here are our new um, uh, our new uh, files. Now, what we need, and I'm sorry if this is really hard to see, but I'm going to uh, label it off here. So a Gatematic hand pad, what I'm looking for is FCU, front copper. There it is. That's the file, this one here. And we open it, and there is our isolation routing file. Now, there's a bit of a problem. The origin point and what the CNC is going to try to start at is over here. So it's going to try to go all the way over here to start that. That's not good. So I'm just kind of going to figure out what my offset is here. Uh, the offset is... X 122 Y 74. So I'm going to subtract 122 and add 74. 122 and 74. So I'm going to double click on this guy, go to transfer, go to offset. No, never mind. Uh, transformations. And I said, 
I'm going to go negative 122. So that offsets bam and 74. So that's my screw up. I forgot to uh, center the origin in uh, KiCad. Uh, this has a very frustrating zoom in interface, but okay, now it's pretty close to the origin. That's good enough. That's That means that CNC is not just going to try to home its axis way off the edge of the machine or not home its axis, but change it. Now I'm going to also open, oops, not project. I'm going to open another Gerber file. I want the edge cuts. There they are. Um, and note again, they're in this wrong position. So we said 122 and 74. So let's double click on our edge cuts and uh, go to transformations. I'm gonna subtract uh, one. Uh, sometimes this, there are bugs here, 122 offset and 74 offset. And the last thing I got to open are my drill files, my Exelon files. So I'm going to tell it to uh, open Exelon, which is control E, control G is Gerber, control E is Exelon. Here is the, um, the plated through hole drill files. These are the only ones that have been made by uh, KiCad that make sense because these are all plated through holes. Uh, note that they're not actually that way. Uh, the CNC is not going to plate anything all right, and now our drills, we have to offset the same way. We're going to go to transformations. We're going to subtract uh, 122, bam, and 74, because I forgot to set the uh, correct location in KiCad. All right, now everything is set. So sorry about that. Um, okay, cool. Look at this. So this is our, I'm going to save this first of all, save, save project as, uh, let's see, is it going to let me go there? Oh, I, I would help if I put double slashes. Nah. Cool. All right, so now we're going to save this as Gatematic and pad flat cam. Sometimes this crashes, so it's always good to have your saved files. All right, this is running uh, in, in Java, I believe, so it works pretty well, but uh, not. It, it does crash from, from time to time. Again, it's beta software. All right, now there's a whole bunch of configuration options uh, that I can set up I am going to show you the ones that I'm going to change so that hopefully you can see that. Um, so we're going to go to the front copper. So we're going to create what's called isolation routing. And this is going to create isolation paths all around here that will isolate copper sections from each other. It's basically going to cut through. So I double clicked on the front copper and I'm going to go to the isolation routing tool. Uh, and I'm going to change the bit type. The default bit type is a 0.1 mil millimeter V bit. I'm going to change this to C1. And this is uh, a 0.5 millimeter V bit, uh, 0.5 millimeter bit. And uh, let's see. So this is a 0.5 millimeter standard uh, flat nosed, uh, flat nosed, uh, I think it's a, it doesn't really have any flutes. It's more kind of grinds it. Actually, I have some spares right here, and I I, pro I actually didn't have this here to uh, to show you. Let me just show you real fast on the actual camera. Uh, I'm going to have to put my finger up so that you can see this because the camera will not focus. See how thin that is? I don't even know if you can see that, uh, but my finger is resting on the top. That is a half millimeter uh, spiral flute uh, cutting bit for the, the CNC. And um, so you will break a few of these. Uh, you know, you'll want to have a lot of these in spare. I've got two boxes of these. They do break. I actually haven't broken one any, any during the CNC process. I've broken plenty of them while I was doing the through hole drilling. And I forgot uh, when I was moving the axis on the machine, telling it to go back home. I forgot that it was happening and it went down into the workpiece and uh, destroyed it. All right, so I've now set half a millimeter bit over here and it's type C1. Again, apologies if you can't see this. I'll, I'll, I'm just trying to narrate it. And then there's a giant button that says generate isolation geometry. And bam, there it is. These red paths are the path that the CNC bit will take. 
And you'll notice it's doing an inside path and an outside path uh, for a lot of these, which tells you that there is still some header and we could have made these tracks and vias a little bit smaller, but not much. Look how close we are on the tolerances and clearances there. Okay, so that's great. Uh, we're gonna generate the CNC object here with this button. And then this uh, creates the actual CNC. This is the Gerbil file, the Gerbil 11 file that gets sent to uh, the CNC machine itself. And I'm going to save the CNC code. And this is going to be called uh, front copper isolation routing CNC.nc. That's the numerical cutting file. I'm going to save that. And let's go back and do our edge cuts. Uh, double click on my edge cuts. This is where we're going to use the cutout tool. And I'm going to use a, uh, I'm going to use the same tool that I used to cut the holes. I'm going to use a 0.8 millimeter, uh, 0.8. Uh, Z depth, everything else is fine. We're going to do multi depth cuts, which means it's going to cut one layer at a time, sort of like a 3D printer. So we don't just try to drag it through the entire board at once. And I'm going to tell it generate rectangular geometry. Bam, there it is on the uh, on the surrounds. And um, we can now go to the edge cuts and generate the CNC object from that. Generate CNC, and there they are. There is the edge cuts. I'm going to save this CNC file as edge cuts. And the last bit we've got is the, the, the plated through holes, the Exelon. Um, by the way, I had accidentally muted my, um, oh, that's the wrong computer. No wonder. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, turn you back off because we are here. I keep forgetting. Can you guys still hear me okay? I'm hoping I didn't break anything. Yep. Yeah, okay, awesome. All right, sorry, sometimes I forgot I was remote desktop. Okay, last thing we're gonna do is go to the Exelon files here. Um, and uh, we're going to change this to a point, it's a 0.8 millimeter. It's specified a little bit funny here. That should work. Um, uh, we need to make sure that this tool is selected. And then we can generate the uh, we can generate the CNC object. Bam, there it is. We have our drill holes, and they're all numbered. It's hard to see in the screen share, but they're all numbered in there. We go back to our project, and we're going to uh, the drill files are already saved as CNC, uh, so those are done. Uh, I'm just going to hit save just to be on the safe side and put them in that folder. And those are all the three files that I need to start this job. And that's it. And in fact, uh, oops, um, there is no way to, you have to zoom out and zoom in. Maybe there's a button that I don't know about for how to scroll on this damn tool, but it is really frustrating. Oh, come on. There we go. There probably is a button to pan and I just don't know where to, what it is, but that's okay. This is what I've been doing. Okay. Um, Cool. So there is our 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 um, our, uh, our project. Pretty cool. Now uh, we're now that we've saved these, we can go ahead and exit. Uh, actually, before I exit, I'll show you. Uh, if you go to the preferences, you can set all of these preferences as defaults, the ones that we used. So we could go to. Uh, the various tools, here is our isolation routing tools. Right now it's set to 0.1 millimeter V-bit. I, I can change this default to the 0.5 millimeter circular. And, um, and then uh, you know, make those changes. I'm not gonna save them right now. But you can, uh, you can set the defaults for all the different tools so that every time you go through here, you don't have to change any values. Now uh, you can also, um, uh, you can disable the plots so you can see, uh, for instance, if I disable all these plots, you can see, for instance, only the CNC components that are going to happen. So these are the CNC moves that are going to happen uh, because I've disabled everything else. But uh, it's sometimes handy to be able to see everything just to double check. All right. Last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to save this and I'm going to start Candle, which is one of a billion different uh, CNC tools that you can use uh, to um, run the CNC. And I'll show you uh, this uh, when we actually run it uh, in the video. Um, the nice thing about it is uh, when you do that, um, it, 
I, I have an offline controller, but um, I, I, I'd rather uh, use the online, the computer-based one, because I'll show you why here in a minute. We have to do tool, tool changes. So um, let's go ahead and open Candle, and um, we need to open the... Um, uh, it's they're going to be here. All right. So here are and I, I sh here are the uh, .nc objects that I've created. They're right there, and those are the three things that we're going to run. So right now, um, I guess I could tell it unlock. I don't have it turned on. Uh, it is connected to the CNC, but it, I mean it won't really matter. So what we do is we hit open, and well, we need to go to the right place. Uh, I can't type, sorry. Really can't type. There we go. All right, so the first one that we're going to do is the uh, the front copper. So uh, the front copper, there it is. And here is our CNC path that it's going to take. And here is everything that's in the queue. Okay, this is these are the actual Gerbil 11 or 1.1 1 .1, uh, commands that are going to be executed. And here is the tool head. Now, right now, the CNC is sitting at a random spot at a random altitude. It does not know where everything is. So the first task is uh, to um, uh, get your tools set up. So we use a number of, of, of little uh, wrenches to uh, secure the correct tool into the collet. And then what it's going to do is it's just going to go around. And uh, I don't know if there's a dry run command that we can do. Uh, oops. Well, that's not going to work because, uh, all right, <laughs> I'm going to reset the machine because, you know, we didn't do anything. I wish there were like a, uh, nope, it just, there's only one option. So right now it thinks it's spinning there, but, you know, the, the unit hasn't, it's not powered, so it can't move anywhere. So, all right, reset. Uh, there's no dry run here, so I won't be able to show it to you moving around for no reason. By the way, we could have avoided this clipping by moving everything down, but it's not going to affect anything. We have enough path to ground through the other sides. All right, so the first thing you do is you use the jog controls uh, after you secure the workpiece. I like to use double-sided, or I like to use uh, blue painter's tape on each side, and then I glue uh, the, you put painter's tape on the spoil board, painter's tape on your piece, and then you use uh, super glue, cyanoacrylate, to glue the two together. That way you can just peel off the tape when you're done. It's very uh, effective. You don't have any like screws or bolts or, or, or whatever in the way that's preventing you from messing that up. Then you use the jog controls to kind of perfectly level it. And then there's a command here called Z probe. There's a Z probe on the CNC. You just put it uh, on top of the workpiece. It'll move the, the, it'll move the head down until it makes contact with the Z-probe, and then it knows exactly what the height is. You do have to calibrate the offset for the Z-probe, but it works really well. Um, OK, uh, once you have that, then you home the XY so that XY is set. The Z is now set because of the Z-probe. And then you just hit Send, and it'll go and cut this out. And this will take, according to this, 19, about 20 minutes to route this. And that sounds about right. It might take about 20 to 25 minutes to go through all this. Once you're done, you increase manually the Z height over here, get it nice and high, not where the limit switches get tripped, but nice and high, and then you tell it um, restore origin, and that'll take you right back to the top left uh, corner there. Okay, see how it's doing that? Now, it's not actually there. Nothing happened because the CNC is not powered. Um, and so it'll take you back to the top left, and uh, then you do your tool change, then you home it again, you do your, not home, sorry, you do your Z probe again because your tool will be at a different height, it's going to have a different length, you do your Z probe, and then at that point you, um, well, maybe before you do that, then you do, uh, let's say, your drills. So here are all the drill holes, and it's just going to go down and through and, and up again and move to the next one. Uh, you, you, cal you, you go back to the origin point uh, with the restore origin, you do your Z probe, you don't hit restore. You don't hit zero X and Y because if you do, everything is off and your holes will not be drilled in the right place. Then you drill your holes, go back to the origin, make sure your Z axis height is nice and high before you go back to the origin so you don't scrape the tool the the, the bit across, 
and then uh, do your tool change again. Then you uh, put what, are, and now I use the same tool for the cutout. You could use something bigger so it's faster. Uh, it's up to you. And then here are the edge cuts. Again, you do the Z probe. You do not touch the zero X, Y because otherwise you'll, you'll be totally off and you'll be cutting through pieces of your circuit. And uh, it'll go through uh, about five, six times on each one of these. And then it'll do the edge cuts, get all those done. This says 15 minutes, which is, sounds about accurate. This is a low power motor on this particular CNC. I do have a higher power motor available. I don't really use it because uh, the low power motor has a lot of accuracy. It doesn't have a lot of run out. Um, and uh, so, yeah, uh, that's it. That is a cut board. Now, uh, let me go ahead and I'm going to close a uh, candle here. We already have access to everything there. Get us back here and I'm going to open up. Um, let me see if I can uh, search Google Photos for a picture of one of these circuits that I made. Okay, it sort of has one here. So that would be March 29th. March uh, 29th. Um, and I'm going to bring this board out for you so that you can see, hopefully. Okay. So uh, here is, this is in Google Photos. Uh, my phone has a really, really depth, shallow depth of field if you use the main camera. So it's going to be really fuzzy for everything but like one piece. But anyway, this is the, the, this is the backside of the PCB. You'll see how all those parts go in. Um, this is the front side. This is where the copper is, and this is what got isolation routed. You see, this is what it looks like. Um, we'll see if Google Photos will, uh, yeah, clean this up a little bit. Okay, so this is what happens when you isolation route this. Look how it actually looks really good. And in fact, the tip was small enough that it even left a few chunks here that the CNC software thinks we're going to get, you know, cut out, but they weren't because you know it just did one pass and it did a really good job. And so these are these nice fat traces, the nice fat clearances, the nice fat um, uh, uh, pads that we need. Now, the next piece is how the heck do you solder this so that it looks, um, you know, more like this? And the answer is a lot of flux, a lot of flux. Basically, you get water soluble flux. You can buy this at Home Depot. You can order it on Amazon. You can do whatever you want. And you coat the entire board in flux. Okay. And uh, what you do is you, you get it coated. And then once everything is coated in flux, you solder it. If you do not do this, okay, the solder will not stick to the copper. You, you'd think it would, but it will not. It will flow all over the place. It'll bridge your connections. It'll bridge your gaps. You will have a very bad day. Uh, but you see here, because I added flux, the copper stayed exactly where it was supposed to. Here it bridged over, but this was a grounded connection, so I don't care. Look, these do not look like very good solder joints, and you are not going to get prize-winning solder joints. This looks like it's doubled, and it's supposed to be, so that's okay. None of these joints are the, uh, what they shouldn't be. I actually had to solder this board in about three minutes as I was heading out the door, so uh, I didn't have time to clean this up. You can wash this flux off. It's water-soluble. Uh, I didn't have a chance to do that. Um, but in any case, take your time when you're soldering it. Use crap tons of flux so you don't get uh, bridging of stuff that shouldn't be bridged because your solder will ordinarily not want to communicate with uh, the, the copper board otherwise because oxide layers will, will form on here all the time uh, and quickly and the, and, the, and the solder won't stick. It just won't bind to it. So the flux helps uh you know get rid of that oxidation and it helps that bimetallic interaction to happen uh, so you need flux when you're doing that uh, you can you know do a little bit of acid treatment to the board just be careful the copper comes off with acid you got to be very careful with that uh, you'll end up with no copper and then no traces the thickness of this copper is extremely thin so you got to be careful if you accidentally drag a multimeter probe or a knife or anything across one of these traces, you are liable to cut it. It's possible. It's not guaranteed, but there's a reasonable chance you could easily cut some of these traces, so be very careful. Last thing I'll tell you is one cool thing that you can do is if you're done with your design, get something called conformal coating or conformal coating. It's basically a waterproofing and antioxidation spray. I did not do it to this board because it's a prototype, 
uh, and this is as installed working, believe it or not, first round. I had designed it at two in the morning and it worked. Um, so um, the conformal coating uh, basically waterproofs and prevents oxidation from happening so that you won't damage the board. Um, and then that will leave you with a working PCB, folks, which is really cool stuff. Um, all right. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes, no, maybe so. Uh, final report is due uh, the last day of final exams uh, plus oh, yeah. day. I think. I'm sorry? I think it's the 30th is what you had told us. 30th, and yeah. the 29th Everything for the demo. Due by the end of the day on the 30th, yeah. End of the day on the 30th. Does that sound doable? Does that sound good? Yeah. yeah. OK. Any questions about the PCB design? I hope you guys found that fun. Um, again, I'll try to put up a video of um, uh, I'll try to put up a video of um, the uh, the CNC milling. I'm going to try to get that done this week for you guys. I also have for you an extra credit quiz. I did not have time to get that ready because um, I made a few changes to it. Uh, are you, the, the folks that are here are typically the ones that are always here. So I'm going to ask you guys, uh, and by the way, anyone in class recording or not is, is, is welcome to take the extra credit quiz. Uh, I can't guarantee that it may work, but, uh, you're welcome to try. Hey, um, you know, give it a shot. Uh, is it okay if I make that available Thursday at 11, our normal start time? Is that okay? Make it Thursday at 11. Can you? you that would be fine that with me. Does that conflict with an exam or anything? Okay. So I'm just going to start at Thursday at 11. I think it's a reading day. It, it, it will take you maybe 30 seconds or less to get it done. Again, everybody's welcome to try try their luck at it if you if you weren't there for the for the uh, for the hints. But those of you who were here for the hints should know exactly what it is. Okay. Uh, Lucas Armstrong has asked off topic. What is your opinion on reflow ovens? Uh, they work. Um, they I have a T962A, which, or sorry, a T962, which is, uh, you know, one of these really cheap Chinese uh, reflow ovens. Uh, they cost about $200, and uh, they come built in with a lot of uh, bugs slash features that you'll immediately want to address before ever turning it on for the first time. Like literally flip the switch. Um, select a profile, make sure that your infrared heaters will come on and then turn it off and don't use it until you've done the fixes. The fixes that I've done to mine are as follows. You take the oven apart carefully and take off all of the duct, or it's, it's uh, masking tape that is used to cover the top of the oven uh, because that will burn and create a lot of smell. And you replace it with Captain tape, which is polyamide film. You replace it with that adhesive polyamide. The second thing that I did was um, I did a firmware update to it. I overwrote the firmware. There's some really cool guides online how to do that. It's super simple. Just take your time. You will need an FTDI cable to do that. Uh, you will need the right one. I believe it's a 3.3 volt unit. Um, and th there is a very nice open firmware out there that does a much better job. Uh, it's written coherent languages, uh, and it allows you a lot of flexibility for custom profiles. So I went ahead and upgraded the firmware. And I think the last thing, the last significant upgrade, there is a few others, but the last significant upgrade that I did is that the that, that T962 and the T962A, which is a larger variant, uh, they have a common defect, which is that the unit makes an assumption about what the cold junction temperature is. In other words, it makes an assumption that the core cold temperature of the circuit board in mounted in the oven is at 20, 20 degrees Celsius, no matter what. And the problem with that is that it's often not that, and that will offset your heating calculations. Um, so I went ahead and added a little, uh, uh, um, a one wire, uh, thermistor, um, and, uh, you know, temperature probe. 
I wired that to an open ADC channel that the firmware was expecting, so it knows how to use it. Actually, it's not an ADC. I believe it's a it's a it's a one wire bus, so it's digital. Um, and uh, so that worked, or it's an ADC pin that can be repurposed as a one wire bus in the software. So that permitted more accurate heating. The last thing you have to do, and this is this is my tip for these reflow ovens you have to do a temperature calibration. So you uh, set it to 100 degrees Celsius, you measure the temperature as best you can with, with an, not an infrared thermometer, those will not work. You need a thermocouple. You need a thermocouple that plugs into a, uh, a multimeter. You need a, a nice a thing that supports a lot of heat and doesn't use, uh, that doesn't get fooled by like metals and stuff like that. So you put a thermocouple probe where roughly where the PCBs are, you let the thing heat up to 100 Celsius, you record the actual temperature, then you heat it up to 200 Celsius, record the actual temperature. That tells you the slope and intercept of, of, your, um, of your calibration, and then you enter that into the upgraded firmware, and it will handle that. If you do all, and then there's a left temperature probe and a right temperature probe in there, and you individually calibrate their offsets. If you do all that, and it is a decent amount of work, it takes a couple hours to get it up and running, you will have spent $200 for an oven that can do pretty much the same thing as about a $1,000 oven. So that may be worth a time investment for you. It was fun for me. It was a fun little DIY project. Uh, and since I've done that, it has worked great. It does, a, it does a really nice job. Is it perfect? No. Could you spend years upgrading it? Yes. Should you spend years upgrading it? No. Uh, just buy something more expensive. But um, for a just baking a few boards, especially with SMD, you know, doing your solder paste and all that kind of stuff, absolutely get one of the cheap ones if you want to try your hand at it. I like them. Um, also, I'm trying right now using my uh, CO2 laser cutter to cut polyamide solder masks so I can spread the solder paste on. Otherwise, you, you know, you have to call JLC PCB and get that. By the way, I have not tried the reflow oven with custom milled CNC boards. I do not know how well that will work. Um, I'm just trying it for the ones that are coming from JLC, um, which is good enough. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions on DIY circuit board design and building and milling and all those wonderful things? Any other pro uh, questions or problems or requests for the class? Anything like that? If not, uh, it has been an absolute pleasure working with all of you guys this semester. I know we've had some significant challenges both in um, with the pandemic, uh, with the class, uh, with um, perhaps some group dynamic issues. Please be aware I am going to be sending out a, a peer evaluation survey on Thursday. Uh, no, I'm going to send it after uh, right around the, the time the final project is due. Please fill those out. They're incredibly important. Please be fair. Please be honest. If someone didn't do a damn thing, please tell me and assess them accordingly. I will not take it out on you, um, or why would I? But I mean, I, I'll make sure that it's done anonymously, so I will not be providing that feedback to anybody. Also, if someone really actually did try, even if you had a personal disagreement with them, give them the credit, you know. Um, but just, uh, just. Um, you know, be honest about your participation, be honest about your, you know, your ability to engage with them and what you guys did together, um, because it really helps me determine the grades at the end of the semester. Um, everybody can make an A in this class. That's how it's structured. Um, at the same time, uh, I want to make sure that uh, everybody who has done the work has earned their credit. Okay. Uh, it will be sent uh, as an announcement in Blackboard, which you'll receive as an email. Uh, and you'll, it's a Google form, so you'll just log in there. You'll put your name, but all, all of the forms will be kept private and anonymous. Nobody else will see them, only me. And I, will, I myself and only I will be grading them, or grading. I will be um, evaluating them uh, and seeing if, if any adjustments are needed to a grade. So I do ask that you please do this. It's, it's very important to me that you provide me with the information on how your group worked. Uh, I try to be really reasonable, flexible, fair, um, uh, but I always also also want to make sure if out of a group of five, only two people were pulling all the all the work, that 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 is accurately reflected. Okay, and it's it's very important that everybody gets the credit that they've earned. Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, any other concerns? Um, good luck with your final projects. If you need anything from me, please reach out. Um, I would say if you need a board milled, please let me know. Uh, Honestly, given the amount of work I have, it's just going to be faster if you order it through JLC PCB. Um, 
the downside to that is if you have an error, I can't just mill you a new one, you know, an hour later. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, it's, it's um, have I etched a board? Andrew, no, I value my brain cells and my nose and everything else. So uh, I have decided not to do that in a house full of kids. Uh, so I just, you know, I haven't tried it. Uh, I, I know it works really well. I know you can even do it with a laser cutter. You can or a laser unit, you can like etch off stuff and then, or you can etch off the, the marker and then put it in uh, the acid bath. But I, I just didn't want to bother that. Yes, it goes down in the basement, but you just never know with some of those stronger acids and the stuff that they release. But there was, so, one, oh, sorry. yeah, I was just, go ahead. One other I had looked into before when I was trying to build some guitar effects pedals and actually using like a um, laser printer and then transferring that and then using electrolysis. Mm. I saw that was another way yeah. I was interested in trying. I haven't tried it before, but that seemed like an interesting technique. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people try that online. I've never tried it myself. Again, it's, it's just all sorts of messy. Uh, I have an SLA printer that I use only under specific circumstances because it's so freaking messy. Just, there's so much cleanup involved. You spend like uh, five seconds well not really five seconds it takes like a few hours to print but you spend so much more time cleaning up uh, than you'd want um so yeah there are many uh there are many ways to uh to to uh to do this um uh, with the pcbs i really do like the cnc because it's fast it's effective it really works um and it's you don't have the mess the only thing you have to do is you have to vacuum up the fr1 bits and you may not want to breathe it in unless you like itchy lung uh, it is fiberglass after all. Uh, but I mean, all of us now have an ample supply of masks and that's probably all you need. Um, so, okay. Any other questions? Any other concerns? All right, folks. Uh, we have gone to time pretty much. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if you uh, need anything between now and the end of the semester, please feel free to reach out. Again, good luck. All the best, uh, and thanks for a fantastic semester, all things considered, and uh, good luck, and have a great summer. See you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.